Welcome everybody to another Fresh Start alumni webinar. Um, we did this last year and uh, Dr. Vanderkolk, you are now a household name in the Orthodox community. I'm sure you were before, but now you're really in household names. I, it I think, didn't come true. Yes, I, I, it was the one last community that you were trying to crack into and um, you're now in, I, I think the podcast with Rabbi YY must have been viewed 20 or 30,000 times, um, which is, uh, you know, meaningful numbers in our community. So um, we're excited to do this, have you back, of course, having Rabbi YY uh, moderate it with us makes it extra meaningful to get both the clinical and the Torah perspective. Um, so welcome, everybody. Okay, so Rabbi uh, YY, if you can sort of lead this off, you must have a few a few uh, points for discussion to start out. Of course, we might have some live questions. I know I have a stack of uh, anonymous questions, but perhaps you can lead this off with some thoughts, some words, and start the open and honest discussion that we try and have here at, at Fresh Start with you and Dr. Vanderkolk. Absolutely. I'd love, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with all of you, the alumni of Fresh Start, and it's a glorious honor to be here with Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. I don't know if everybody knows this, but Dr. Bessel van der Kolk has been dealing with this theme of trauma for, I believe, 50 years, right? Yeah, pretty much so. Yep. That's a half a century, and has really revolutionized the landscape of... Uh, much of human civilization in our sensitivity and understanding and awareness of this reality that obviously it's part of existence for thousands of years, but I guess it never had a name. And that's why I wanna, I wanna really ask, I wanna ask the doctor, I think on behalf of all of us, I wanna ask three questions that maybe you could address. Number one, do you think there are certain people who have trauma and they really can't be helped? It's just beyond repair. Number two, can you share with us one or two stories from your experience 50 years of really serious cases of trauma and how they have been helped? And number three, I want you to, if, if you could just give us perspective, you know, we as Jews are very um, assiduous students of history. Our history dates back literally 4,000 years. Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Moses, Joseph, and, and we live it, you know, we have everyday rituals to commemorate, you know, our time in Egypt and, and Sinai and the early days in, in, in Israel, it, it, it's really incredible. And we have been through a lot as, 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 as a people, as you know, last time Dr. Bessel shared with us his experiences. I think your father was captured by the Nazis, if I'm not mistaken, right? You shared that with us. And, and I, what I'm trying to understand, it's not just an abstract question. My third question is, in all these thousands of years, without the word trauma, <laughs> without the awareness of the neurosciences, you know, they focus so much on, on doing the right thing, getting married, having children, being a good person and a kind person, um, what did they do with, with all the paralysis, the emotional paralysis, disassociation, detachment that we know today with before, you know, EMDR and, 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 psych and psychedelics and yoga and spirituality? Um, did faith and spirituality have such a power to be able to help heal it? Is there a new phenomenon, things happening in the last generation that weren't happening before? If you could give us just... So that sweeping perspective, if you have, on, on the historical process and where we are today. I, I think all three questions are great. Um, of course, there's, there's always been trauma, and human beings have never been able to get it together to create non-traumatic situations. So I, I, I've traveled a great deal. I also very much into history. And the Aztecs didn't figure it out, and the Mayas didn't figure it out, and the Zulus didn't figure it out, and the Vietnamese didn't figure it out, the Buddhists didn't figure it out. None of us has ever figured out how to live a life uh, where people don't do terrible things to each other. And what also impresses me is that every culture has found ways of trying to deal with it. Uh, uh, you go to China, and even today, and I've been there, I've been there for the last three years, but 
lost it quite a bit before. And you see people everywhere in parks doing Qigong and Tai Chi. And when you start participating in it, you go, oh, that's what they do to calm themselves down because it really is a very scary place to live. I think the Hasidim uh, had their own particular ways of, of dealing with things. And I think the dancing and the moving and the singing and the rituals of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah were very much trauma rituals where you really remember and feel and are allowed to feel what you feel. Uh, I see, uh, and uh, blowing the shofar and the singing together uh, and these long out breaths that are part of uh, Jewish singing. Uh, uh, actually, that is not unique to Judaism. The Buddhists also have long out breaths. Even the Calvinists, where I come from, which are the most uptight people in the world, they also do singing with long out breaths. <laughs> and so, but every culture discovers in their own way that you can slow down your heart rate and become calmer by these long whoosh my Israel, blah, 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 these long sounds that every religion has and then moving together and singing together uh very powerful ways of of people connecting with each other and you see variations to that when you go to Buenos Aires you see people doing tango dancing and from my perspective I see that I'm in awe of what people do and I think to myself that's a great trauma therapy because when you are traumatized, you feel disconnected from other people. And when you do tango dancing, you really learn to mold your body into another person's body. And you really both, you, you together determine what action you're going to take. And that's a very, uh, very subtle, but very powerful way of helping you to own your body and your own sensations and you feel powerful, and you feel a sense of joy. Uh, so uh, the question for me is always, is what do you have in your community that you have, to, how you've dealt with things? And you certainly, have, the Judaism has a, a many profound ways of dealing with it that to some degree is different from other cultures and to some degree is the same. Uh, and indeed, uh, looking at how, how people have dealt with it, and then you have the Old Testament where you talk about King David dancing through the streets of, of Jerusalem, uh, and that uh, you see that uh, there's a lot of stories about how people have dealt with trauma. Uh, basically, the Old Testament, to some degree, is a trauma trauma book, a trauma treatment book, also. Uh, uh, and then the surrender and going into the desert and becoming still. Uh, these are all parts of how people have dealt with the inevitable, horrible things that happen to human beings. And I think Judaism, as much as anything, any other uh, group of people, has really, uh, you know, a, a lot of this work comes out of Judaism. Most of my colleagues uh, early on uh, were come from the Jewish tradition, actually. Uh, it, it is the uh, there's a long tradition in Judaism of interoception, introspection, looking at yourself, looking at your relationship to your community, looking at your relationship to God, um, and these are these are these are precious parts of your heritage, actually. And so uh, then the, the point becomes is. What is it about my community that helps me with this? And then to also look at what is it in my community that gets in the way. Huh? And uh, there's always things that get in the way and nothing ever works perfectly for everybody. And for me, uh, one of the more, more complicated things in orthodoxy is the issue of patriarchy, that somebody has all the answers and that it may not be easy for you to come up with your answers. And in order to lead your life, you need to actually own your own answers and not only be a follower of somebody else, of course. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people are so traumatized, they don't even have a memory, right? It's pre-verbal. Oh, absolutely. Actually, uh, fundamentally, uh, trauma has an impact on you. You know, what I did his first uh, neuroimaging studies of trauma, and what we saw is that, that when people are into their trauma, that the whole verbal part of the brain breaks down. So basically trauma is a non-verbal experience. And when you 
feel terrified or frightened or become uh, get out of control and become really very aggressive and do very nasty things. Uh, you don't have a mental uh, formulation of, oh, I'm so mad because this reminds me about how helpless I was when my father beat me up many years ago. And now I'm going to hit you because it reminds me about my father. No, you just have an automatic reaction that makes you blow up or freeze or uh, or collapse. You're saying if the emotional memory has a time and a place and a story, that's not the trauma we're talking about. That's well, pain. You see, the, the part of the brain that's, that stores the imprint actually has no notion of time. And so this becomes a timeless experience. And when something around me happens that, that matches some of this all sensations, you automatically go into this emotional state. And it's really only when you go to therapy that you go, oh, I feel those emotions when I'm in a situation like that, that is actually, that started off when my father beat the hell out of me or when somebody did an inappropriate sexual thing with me. But that's not where people start. That's a discovery process usually. And so what is helpful is that this whole contemporary trauma interest started with veterans and with veterans it's relatively easy because they're relatively mature people who hopefully are somewhat put together before they go to war and then something happens and they say oh i've been so upset since i saw my best friend getting blown up or i've been freaked out since i killed that child that i feel so terribly guilty about so when you deal with adults they are able to make that connection with particular event quite well but if you get traumatized as a kid creating that sequence really takes a lot of effort oftentimes and it's i don't think i've ever seen a person who came to see me who had never had therapy before who said oh i have a, a terrible marriage in which i become really angry and upset with my spouse all the time and that is that reminds me about how my father used to treat me or what my mother did to me. That, that connection gets made in therapy. So you get to only experience it. Oh, I felt that way as a child. That was that this is my old experience coming to revisit me again. So is there a fundamental difference in the reaction of the person if a person experiences trauma or a series of traumas, say at age two, three, four, five, versus 9 10 11 12 because of the memory and i always encourage everybody to hang who's interested in this, to hang out with very small children and what you see is that every month you deal with a different child with different capacities because you see that mind and that brain grow and so a, a small human being is a growing human being and your brain and your mind gets formed by your experience. So if you get traumatized early on in life, it affects your identity and who you are and the whole organization of your brain and your mind. If you're a well-formed adult, if something terrible would happen to you or me at this point, you still have the memory of your being a relatively well-functioning adult, maybe not as well-functioning as everybody else thinks you we do, but still uh, we, have, we got it together and we have a memory of who we are before the trauma. Mm. But there is uh, an I, there's an I pre-trauma. Yeah. Where and, the trauma early on, there was no I. The trauma becomes oh. the I. Now you, you become your trauma. The, the, the trauma gets interwoven. Oh. Into in your, very identity. I am trauma. I am trauma. Walking yeah. trauma. Or I cause trauma. Kids are very ego. Kids are by necessity egocentric. They don't understand people outside of themselves. So everything they experience is about me. And so if you get abused as a child, you feel like I cause people to beat me up. I cause people to hate me. And so you think that. You own the experience and you become the experience to some degree. You're not, you're not blaming your father or your brother or your babysitter. It's you. No, no, it's you that I caused this to happen. As a kids, kids, that causality thing is, is not online with kids, uh, completely understandable because they don't know other perspectives. It takes a long time before you get to see that. And so if somebody does something to you, it is because of you.
Yeah. And, and so then you start weaving wow. it into your identity. Yeah. So your whole story of identity is all formed by the trauma. Yeah. Our identities are formed by the experiences we have. The, the, the brain, the mind is the accumulation of experiences. And so if you have had a lot of loving experiences and you feel uh, cared for by people and you feel like I'm okay the way I am, uh, then that becomes a part of you that that has a hard time disappearing, even of if terrible things happen to you later on, because the basic wow. impulse of- Some people here in this program, they always doubt that they're traumatized because they have no memory. What are the symptoms when you look at somebody how do I look in the mirror and say, you know what, I have trauma? How do I know? Yeah. Because uh, I, you know, my identity covered it up very well. We learned to cope and yeah. to survive. You know, our reptilian brain has taken over. <laughs> no, we, want but, to, uh, we know how to copy people, please right. people, form. How do I know that I'm that I'm a, a living trauma victim? How? Well, uh because you know that you have certain patterns. Right? Uh, we learn it in our relationships. And so uh, if you learn that whenever you get close to somebody, you become terribly dependent on the person, you become clingy, uh, you become extremely jealous and angry, let's say. Uh, then, and it, and first time it happens, you blame it on your partner. And the second time it happens, you blame it on your partner. And the third time it happens, it's a, it's happened again. Maybe there's something about me mm. that causes that. And then, and that's where therapy becomes helpful in helping somebody to explore how long you have felt this way, when you've seen this before, and also to really notice that a part of you is very needy and dependent, not all of you, and to really differentiate uh, that we have multiple parts and not all of us are like that and to really then get to see, have some compassion for that part of you that gets so angry or so jealous and to really get to know that part really well by deep self-exploration and then you uh, become aware that you have this very needy part and then memories oftentimes come up of how needy you were back then and how people pushed you away or disappointed you at some point. From your 50 years of experience, what are the two or three or four greatest methods that have proven to help people with real trauma? Uh, well, the I think the number one issue still is uh, words and being seen and being known and having somebody to help you in a non-judgmental way to to explore who you are and who you react to. So the first step has always be, been to learn to be honest with yourself, but your own shame about what comes up may get in the way of, of really doing that. And so that's where therapy comes in of somebody who helps you. You go, oh, that's very understandable. Of course you feel this way. Let's go a little deeper. Who helped you with the issue of shame? And so that still is the foundation, and everything else. Empathetic friendship. Empathetic friendship. Uh, Empathetic yeah, friendship. It, it's not quite friendship because it's not mutual. And somebody is there for you. Right. You not need to be there for the other person. You just need to pay a bill. <laughs> but but it's it's a it's not a mutual reciprocal relationship. Right. It's, a, it's sort of a funny relationship in a way that somebody is totally there for you huh? uh, in, a, in, a, in a gentle and sometimes somewhat confrontative way of, hey, let's go a little deeper, let's understand a little bit. But it, that's still, that still is the foundation of, <clears throat> of understanding and knowing and going inside. Uh, and that's, there's nothing new about that. Uh, what is new is this crazy thing, EMDR, uh, which is so uh, strange because it's so simple. And my reaction is always, how come people didn't invent this before? Because it's as simple as could be. And EMDR is a wonderful treatment for traumatic memories to help to soften, uh, to make these old reactions, automatic reactions to things that 
remind you of being beaten or whatever, and to just soften the impact and make things into a memory. Uh, and that EMDR for me was was a very powerful thing because both because it's a very helpful tool, but also because it's such a crazy method, bringing your fingers in front of people's face like. And how strange is that? And it really opened up my mind that maybe strange things may work. Uh, and uh, and that our tradition, Jewish tradition, is also uh, there's two ways of dealing with things. One is to yak, and boys, the Jewish tradition is very good at yakking. <laughs> and the other one is is taking pills uh, and changing your chemistry. That is normal. Uh, but then you go to China and you see people do make these strange body movements. You go, oh, that seems to work too. And you go to Africa and you see people drum and move and dance. And that seems to help too. So you get to see that other cultures have found different ways of dealing with these physiological systems. Uh, so, uh, so EMDR, very helpful, very basic tool, uh, fascinating how it works. I've done some research in that and how effective it is to deal with specific memories. Uh, the second thing that is really uh, new-ish, that has been around for a while, but has not come to fruition, is neurofeedback. Uh, and that is uh, that you can play computer games with your own brainwaves. So we have the technology to, uh, to harvest people's brainwaves projected on a computer screen, you can sort of see basic brain activity to some degree, and you can play games with your own brain to help you to create connections and circuits in your brain that help you to focus more and to be quiet and to pay more attention. Uh, so uh, to my mind, neurofeedback is the most underutilized uh, thing. Uh, I think the third thing that has been a major advance, uh, but again, not new. These things get invented and disappear. Uh, is body-oriented work, uh, and really getting in touch with how your body responds to things and the work of people like, people like Peter Levine and Pat Ogden. Uh, but, you know, there's this new formulations of things that have been around for a long time. Uh, and then... Uh, the other thing is that I think is, was very powerful that sort of came and to some degree went uh, is group therapy. Uh, you know, the way we started off in Boston when a, a group of us really got fascinated with trauma, uh, we always met with people in groups. And, uh, you know, people who are traumatized are so ashamed about their reactions, so afraid, ashamed of what they do. And when in a group with other people who are really feel messed up by what's happened to them, and they are so ashamed of themselves, and then you meet other people and they have had similar experiences, and you find out, oh, they also cut themselves with razor blades. Now you have to be crazy to cut yourself with razor blades, but then you're in a room with other people who have found the same solution. And you go like, oh, you too. Oh, you too blow up. You too lose it. You all you also collapse. And so it's really very good for people to discover that you're not alone and that other people are struggling with the same uh tourists that you struggle with. Um, and that other people try just as hard as you do, and that you can support each other in your efforts to have a useful life. I think the issue of peer support is grossly overlooked right now in a profession. Huh? And it's fascinating for me that we started off, we started with Vietnam veterans. I was not in Vietnam. I was not a Marine. Uh, and so I would have been pretty out to lunch, pretending like I knew what it was like. But I sat in the group and people talked to each other about their war experiences. And I got to really learn a lot about what that experience is like. But they helped each other. I just basically uh, created a container in which people could open themselves up to each other. And I think that is really very important and to my mind continues to be very important to feel like this is not a vertical issue of somebody out there who knows everything and you know nothing. Uh, when you're a traumatized person, you are an expert in trauma. <laughs> no. And- uh, Rabbi, 
Rabbi yeah. Waiwai and Dr. Vessel, just to comment on what you just said, um, there's no doubt, and we've heard this from our participants in the group and, you know, reaching up to 200 people at this point that have gone through the Fresh Start program. One of the most powerful dynamics by far is um, just being in the room with five other individuals from different backgrounds, different ages, different walks of life. And and like you said, feeling, feeling some relief that it's, oh, it's not it's not just me and different communities and different ages. And the other part that you mentioned, which Dr. Porch has called with us witnessing, just being able to be heard and seen is, is mightily powerful. Without judgment, without yeah, judgment. Absolutely. Without, yeah, because for that, if it's judgment, we can go back to our you know, places of origin if we wanted to be judged. Um, you know, that we have everywhere. That's, that's, that's easy to come by. As you're talking, I'm thinking about the Psalms, you know, and how beautiful the Psalms are also. And, and you know, they're, they're very sad and devastating uh, poems, basically. Yeah, King uh, David is very honest, very yeah, honest. Yeah, but it, and it, and it, when you read the Psalms, you go like, oh, he too. I feel that way. I know what that's like. Uh, 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 very powerful experiences. Uh, and I could very well see, uh, I've not seen it done recently, that there's a trauma group that focuses on the Psalms as, an, as a point of origin, actually. Wow. There was a, one of the great Hasidic masters, he yeah. once said that when two people meet and they open up to each other, yeah. our judgment, he put it, he said, it's two divine souls ganging up on one reptilian brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. What about uh, psychedelics? Psychedelics. Well, uh, psychedelics, of course, is the hot topic. Um, and actually, my lab is studying psychedelics, and I'm about to come out with a really very, very major research paper on psychedelics. Uh, it's a very hot topic. Uh, it can certainly create transformations, uh, just like deep religious experiences can, in some ways, psychedelics mimic deep, deep uh, spiritual experiences. You know, it's interesting at, in, in the world I live in, the, my science world, you cannot talk about spirituality, you cannot talk about transcendence, but in fact, when you take psychedelics, you cannot help but arriving in a world that's much larger than you are, that has very profound spiritual dimensions. And what we see in psychedelics, uh, in trauma, is that when you're traumatized, you're locked in a particular view of the world that is very narrow and very circumscribed. And when you take psychedelics, you are opened up to another uh, universe that's much more complex than the universe you ordinarily live in. Uh, sometimes it's very frightening. Uh, many psychedelic experiences are not fun and games, but you really get exposed to knowing Oh, I'm just a small part of the universe, and and the universe is so much larger than the universe that I've uh, come to live in, and I think psychedelics really open up deep new capacities for multipotentiality in people, and to really uh, you get to experience uh, from an internal point of view very different perspectives that you ordinarily are accustomed to. But many people also say, correct me, that it helped them actually recover memories that they are traumatized, that as children, their lives were completely shattered, that they were never aware of. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's also had this part of my warning about psychedelics. The psychedelics blow your mind. And uh, it's happened with me also personally. Uh, you, you find out things about yourself and your past that may be very painful, actually. And so the, the big concern I have about psychedelics is the issue of set and setting. And that in our research, uh, we are extraordinarily careful and we prepare people and we get to know people really well and they feel safe with us and they come in and they spend eight hours with two therapists. They stay overnight. The next morning they get debriefed. So it's a very safe process where if very painful stuff comes up, you feel like, yes, this is horrible and I, 
I, I can't stand it, but there's somebody with me to hold me while I see this very dark past. You think without that, it could be destructive? You feel oh, like yeah, I'm very concerned that if had, uh, right now these substances are still largely illegal, when they become legal and they get monetized, that people start cutting corners, as is already happening in ketamine, that people go into little cubicles, they give an infusion left by themselves. And I think that's very potentially dangerous. You need to be held, you need to feel safe, and somebody needs to be with you who knows you and who you trust. Uh, so in, in the psychedelic world, we talk a lot about set and setting and, uh, uh, and where you do it and with whom you do it is as a critical variable. Huh? Uh, and so uh, don't blow your mind by yourself. Uh, do it under very careful conditions. And, and look what, whatever may come up. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All kinds of things will come up that you couldn't expect and cannot prepare yourself for. Rabbi Waiwai and Dr. Bessel, um, the, the questions are piling in, so I was hoping hey, to hey. Uh, I was hoping to jump into that. And again, Rabbi Waiwai and Dr. Bessel, as we ask these questions, we're always looking for both the uh, clinical and the Torah perspective to make sure that they're all aligned. So, uh, Dr. Vanderkolk, if Rabbi Waiwai says anything that's clinically inaccurate, you'll you'll chime in there and and vice versa. I don't have it. Okay. I do want to good. ask the doctor from, from a scientific perspective, yeah. because in Judaism, this is a very powerful idea. Is there a self that you would say that is yeah. indestructible, even if you were raped and, 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 and hurt and beaten and traumatized in terrible ways? From your experience with people, I don't know how many, over a half a century, would you say that you could you could tell this to a person that there is a core self or or a soul or or an existence that remains above the destruction? It's a the question is a very important question. And my friend Dick Schwartz, who uh, who formulated internal therapy, uh, says that there's always this indestructible self. Uh, being a more of a neuroscience oriented person and seeing the incredible damage that trauma can inflict on people, uh, I would not embrace that entirely. I think it's a very good position to take. And I think his understanding that the things that people do to manage and try to take care of this, that core sense of self is what gives rise to the complex problems is a is a very useful way of looking at it uh, so your your opening question is are some people so damaged that there is nothing you can do uh, i have always assumed that uh, that that you can always find things to improve on and my work has very much been focused on uh, unlike some of my colleagues who study one particular treatment method and who say oh now we have found a treatment method of choice it works for 55% of people and that they're satisfied with it. I've always been intrigued with, yeah, but how about 45% for whom it doesn't work? Huh? And so like EMDR works for a lot of people and for some people it doesn't work. And so, uh, and then I got to neurofeedback and I think neurofeedback probably has been helpful for just about everybody I've worked with to make some changes. And so I think, our job as therapists and clinicians and scientists is to always keep exploring what else might help this person. And I, my job is not to give up on people, but to really keep discovering new things. And that means having an open mind and saying on a regular basis, I don't know. And too many people don't say, I don't know. But because you can only learn if you say, I don't know. So so Rabbi why why did he did he discover the neshama scientifically or not? What was the what was his answer? Well, you heard the doctor said that he has one goal and that is to help people to. to the, That's to, our job. To yeah. How did you avoid becoming cynical and maybe depressed with with the amount of pain and and and, and that horror that you have seen in your life? Like yeah, but, you don't seem cynical like. 
No, no, you know, why not? It's because our humans, about human nature, about society, about our future. Yeah, yeah, and, and part of me is quite cynical, uh, but okay. uh, working working with very motivated survivors is enormously uh, inspiring. Uh, that uh, regularly, uh, almost everybody I see, I get to hear what they went through, and I go, "How did you survive?" How did you cope? I have no idea whether I would have been able to, to deal with what you had to deal with. And what you really get to work with is this astounding life force that people carry inside of themselves. Wow. The people themselves may be unaware of, but basically- you have some so, secret, secret divine basically. core. And of course, that you see that the Old Testament is just like that. <laughs> It's one horror story after another. And yet people go on and people find a way. And <laughs> Joseph is thrown into a pit by everybody. You know, his right. brothers right. and right. his master's wife. And he becomes, yeah. and he says, you didn't sell me. God sent me. God sent me. <laughs> no, uh, he frames the narrative. You know, one thing I'm sad about is that as I was growing up uh, in Western society, we had one uh, core orient, orienting thing, and that was the Bible. And so at least we had the, a common reality to be dealt with. Today, we, nobody has a common reality anymore. We don't have a core sense. I think the Old Testament is a be beautiful sort of starting point to define reality because it's a very rich book. Uh, not being a, a believer myself, when you read about Bhagavad Gita and what the, how the Hindus do it, I go, that's a very good way of, of dealing with things also. But we need to serve this, this core uh, framework through which we can see the world. And I think uh, the, the, the Torah is, is a beautiful yeah. framework. Well, can I ask a, a question? Maybe it's, it's an unfair question, but I'm just wondering, and I think all of us would benefit from it. You have been in this field for 50 years. Can you share with us one or two moments that that astounded you, that you who are seeing so much said, oh, wow, it, it shook you to the core, something oh, that really- Actually, this happens all the time, regularly. Huh? Uh, people come in and like, uh, let me give an example. Uh, a guy comes in my office who is a immigrant from somewhere else, and he's a, a junior professor at MIT and is a big athlete. And uh, he has an accident on his bicycle where a car hits him and drags him along and basically shaves off one of his legs. And he is devastated. He comes to my office, he's on crutches, and he says, I was a great athlete. I've lost all my power. I've lost, and, and, and I feel completely desperate for that guy who was such a beautiful athlete who's now a cripple. And I started doing EMDR with him and he goes like, starts laughing. And he says, as this car was dragging me along, I reached up and I held onto the bumper of the car and otherwise the, the, the wheels of the car would have driven over me. Boy, I'm so grateful for that arm that survived me. More EMDR, he goes, wow. And I'm grateful for that leg that helped me up and is now destroyed because if that leg hadn't helped me up, it would have gone in my pelvis and my abdomen and I would have been dead right now. And so internally, he sort of reframed the whole accident as a way in which his body helped him survive. And he walks out of my office on crutches and he says, I'm alive, I'm alive. Huh? Nothing I said or did made it, but I activated something in his own internal capacities that allowed him to reframe what had happened to him. Uh, uh, this is not an atypical example. This may happen to me once a month, something like that. Or uh, the other thing that I love to do is psychodrama. Uh, complicated, interesting. We haven't done it since the pandemic, but it's a beautiful form of treatment where you get to enact uh, scenes from the past where you get to have a different outcome. And uh, so somebody's 
mother is doing that, some father is doing that, and you get an ideal parent who you choose and then holds you and so it gives you the physical experience of if I'd been your mother back then, I would have held you like this. And you go like, oh my God, if somebody would have helped me like this, my whole life would be different and it becomes part of your internal world. And I see it almost every time we do that, people go like, yeah, now I know what it feels like to be loved. I didn't know that before. Yeah. We see it in our psychedelic work all the time. Uh, you know, almost everybody who's part of our study, I hear their story and I go like, how the hell are we going to help this person? They have their psychedelic experience and almost everybody ends up on the other side and they have new insights, new understandings. You know, a woman comes to mind who, whose husband brutalized her and her children and at some point she just could not take his brutalization anymore. She could not kidnap her children and she went away uh, to Boston and he was just devastated. And she did psychedelic experiences with us and she's able to contact her unbelievably horrible husband and to negotiate with him and to quietly sit down and to reorganize some sort of arrangement where she can take care of her kids while her kids continue to be brutalized by this man. And she is quiet enough to just have a deeply mindful capacity to be as much of a helpful mother as she can possibly be. And I just, I'm just in awe of a person learning how to do that. Yeah. So and, on, on, on that topic, can I ask a follow-up question? You talk about a mother, it's one of the questions that came in. Um, you know, so many people doing work on themselves have, uh, you know, especially in our community where families and children are an integral part of who we are. Um, you know, you're working on yourself at the same time. You have a family, you have children. One question came in, what if I'm a very in tune mother and I'm doing all that I'm supposed to uh, and my child is going through a huge trauma right now, parental abandonment by one of his parents. Um, how do I get this child through it? If I want to see him, I just want to take it away. What can we do? What can I do as a parent to help him avoid severe traumatic experience? I'm the parent who wants to keep him safe and see him. How do, how do, how do we help a child through an experience that is traumatic? There's no doubt. But I guess, I guess, and I guess that question is how do we make a Tra traumatic experience, non-traumatizing. Well, you cannot protect your kids from everything. You know, I, I, we just watched um, Steven Spielberg's latest movie about his autobiographical movie, uh, The Fagelmans. And it's a beautiful movie. And his mom is having an affair and actually disappears. And it's extremely painful for the family. Uh, and uh, Spielberg really portrays it very beautifully. You cannot protect your kids, but the dad, both the dad and the mom in this case, really do continue to be present uh, for the child. And so just, yes, painful things will happen. Uh, your kid may become sick. Your kid may not have an operation, but you're being there and keeping them company and not abandoning them. And uh, continue to play with them and continue to uh, feed them and try to give them a sense of pleasure and enjoyment and maybe dancing together and make plays and music together or uh, and and how does and I guess how does it work when the child is you know not taking to all those things we as the parents want to be able to be there we want the child to be able to receive and then smile again yeah. but of course in their life they're still going is it does it make sense that we are impacting them in a positive way, even if we don't see that immediate effect where we bring a smile to the kid's face? Like, is it possible that we could still be providing them that safety and security that will ultimately benefit them? Oh, you know, the but, but, but sort of being obscured by the trauma thing is the attachment thing. Huh? And the attachment thing is 
even more important than trauma, that if you feel safe with a particular person, that is the core of our being in some ways. We, we are not individuals. We think we're individuals, but in fact, we're all part of larger networks of human beings. And we are defined by the networks of human beings. We are physiological. Safety depends on the safety with other people. We are tribal intertwined creatures. And so even when we go very hard, through very hard time, having somebody be there for us uh, and, and seeing us and trying to help us, uh, uh, and make, uh, if you've ever been to a hospital and the nurses do take care of you and they are there when you suffer pain, uh, they can't take the pain away, but the attention and the taking things seriously and uh, and the knowing that somebody is on your side is incredibly powerful. And, and again, that applies even if at that moment we're not bringing the smile to the child's face. He's still sad. He's still, that's, that's yeah. part of the process. It's not meant to have an immediate. Life sucks good amount of the time. And that's the way it is. It's not like we can be happy all the time. No, sometimes something happens and you feel happy. And some people die in our lives all the time. People get sick all the time. People get it, go away. People uh, may turn on us. It's part of life. And, uh, and I think you learn to tolerate it better if you have early experiences of people who are there for you and who help you to tolerate your pain, not to make the pain go away, but to accept your pain. And again, what, what, and one of the things that I think I, I we learned from you in one of our supervisions was that trauma is not per se caused by the event. It's and I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. It's caused by the lack of ability to safely express it or a place to be safe, secure, and seen. You know, it's more about what happens after the traumatic event. Yeah, the traumatic event itself. It's not strictly one or the other. But by and large, if something happens to you that's horrendous and people come and be with you and see you and acknowledge the reality of what you go through and do their best for you, that makes a vast difference. Huh? Uh, the worst thing is to be told, uh, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about huh? or uh, get over it. Uh, or don't be stupid. Huh? So the lack of acknowledgement about the validity of your emotions is is very damaging, actually. So so it's it's creating again to paraphrase, it's creating a safe space, I guess, for a child to express those emotions, knowing that he won't be judged, ridiculed, um, and not not having him shove them back inside, but rather express them and and knowing that he's safe. Yeah, and and to. And to know that somebody uh, is there for you to hold you and that you see it come to an end. So that becomes part of your internal framework, neurobiologically ingrained, that you go like, yes, I remember becoming really upset and frightened then. And then people were there for me. And so in the future, when something terrible happens to you, that memory of, yes, I felt this way before, mm -hmm. but... I also remember the love that came to me at that time becomes part of the internal framework of who you are. And so if you get abandoned at that point, then the unpleasant experience gets com gets aggravated, contaminated, and amplified by the fact you had to do it all by yourself and you lost, you had this deep sense of abandonment at that particular point. And that becomes, to a large degree, the trauma. So you're saying sometimes a child, say, can be molested by their father or somebody else, but if they have a mother or somebody else who's there for them, that can really protect them from falling well, To a large degree. But of course, kids are, uh, are, are wired to love their parents. And so when one of your parents start molesting you, uh, that sets up an, in an incredible confusion in your mind. Wow. And... Uh, a kid loves, does this mean that he loves me or that he hates me? Is this pleasure? Is this pain? Am I betraying somebody? And so uh, it's very confusing for a kid to 
have a, a secret thing happening to them. And yes, having a loving mother is good, but uh, it still creates a tremendous conflict in their child. Is that one of the worst forms of trauma when your father... Yeah, yeah. Or, or your mother. It, it, it's not only fathers too. Because you can't even acknowledge that they're doing something wrong because you love them. Because our attachment system is so wired. You need them. Huh? You depend on your parents. And so if the people you depend on also do terrible things to you, you, uh, you, you deny the reality of your hurts in order to continue to be nurtured and protected. And wow. if internal, so you can't even acknowledge that your father or mother did something. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, and you'd be told you should be a good member of the community, but you're not able to tell that somebody molested you. So your whole self is, is destroyed. Yeah. It, 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 and, and the Orthodox people I've seen in my practice are very much caught in that because the community is so important, but you cannot say what has happened to you. And, and we have a big commandment in the Ten Commandments, respect yeah. your father, yeah, 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 yeah. your mother. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a glorious part of Jewish culture, respect yeah. for parents and grandparents. But if they are molesters and rapists, it's a disaster. It's very hard. It's very the hard. line in Psalms, you mentioned Psalms as healing. Chapter 27, King David says, my father and mother have abandoned me and God took me in. Ah. Do you feel that God and spirituality in that context can be a profound source of healing for trauma? It can be, but I think very often when these terrible things happen to you, you ask me, have you become cynical? And I haven't, but it's very easy to become cynical and to lose the sense of spirituality. I think uh, being able to be spiritual is a gift that comes from having very good experiences also. Huh? And so there are exceptional people who are able to, to turn to spirituality in the face of horrendous things happening in their own group. But I think that's a very special gift to, to receive actually. What, what, one question, Doc, on what you just said, and Rabbi Wai, while you were talking about sexual abuse, a question that came in here. Um, it does does I'm I'm assuming it could be a similar reaction if it's um, you know physical abuse uh, you know does it have the same impact is there something specific I mean I'm, again sexual abuse has its own unique set of pain and trauma that comes with it but as a general rule do you find that physical abuse also um, can share similar uh, painful realities and trauma? See, I think physical abuse is much clearer. Uh, it's objective, it does it, uh, and you know this is a bad thing to do. Sexual abuse is much more complex in that it starts with holding and touching and things that give you a sense of pleasure oftentimes, and then it's a much more complex situation to figure out uh, and much more insidious and really almost impossible to I mean, sex, sex is complex enough even for adults uh, in, a, in a healthy setting it, yeah. uh, and to figure out what it means and what it does to you what happens to your body and what your body wants and doesn't want is, is a very complex thing uh, physical abuse is like you should not hit your kid and if you hit your kid, you know it happens. It's objective. You could have taken a picture of it, and there it is. So, in some ways, it's easier to manage. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a few other topics I want to get to, and I know we're we're getting short on time. Um, so, this question came in, and Doc, and I think in the past we've had, uh, again on supervision, you've had some very insightful stuff on the topic. So, the question is. I learned that all reactions and responses are indications of hurt from the past, but currently, or strong reactions, I would say, but currently struggling with self-harm, and I don't feel any big feelings or thoughts with it. I just want to do it because, almost like a, a fetish of liking scars, is that possible, or am I just not as in touch with my feelings around this topic? And if we can spend a minute or two, you know, I know, again, you have a unique approach, and 
self-harm is is not uncommon within our community rabbi why why you probably have uh experienced yeah. many questions and people i know it's a big topic so maybe just give your give your version doctor if you can on what is self-harm and and how does how does a parent or even a a survivor themselves look at self-harm in a in a way that can lead to healing uh, so self-harm is uh, quite a common way of of trying to manage unbearable feelings huh? and uh many mental health professionals wag their finger and say you should not do that uh that's not my approach uh, self-harm may be disfiguring and it may be um, really unpleasant for other people but uh, it is clearly a way of coping so i would start off with uh, what does it do for you how does this help you what happens to you when you don't do it uh what what builds up uh, when you don't harm yourself. Um, what has happened at that particular time that gives you an impulse to harm yourself? Uh, so you have an automatic reaction to shut off some feeling, and I'd like to see what gave rise to that reaction and what was it that triggered you to try to shut yourself down or do whatever you do with self-harm. And so I'd like to really explore with people uh, what the context is, and uh, make them more aware of what it does for them, what it doesn't do for them. And in the people, all the people I've worked with, uh, many people I've worked with uh, have been self-mutilators at some point. At some point, they start caring for their bodies and they start uh, loving their bodies and see how, how precious they are. And they really stop harming themselves because they find more effective ways of calming themselves down. But so this, this participant who asked the question, if I'm uh, summarizing, Doc, it sounds like continuing to be curious, there's probably something deeper there. It's probably not just liking the scars. Oh, you, not probably. I would say not, okay. Okay. you can be pretty okay. sure. And so she says, I'm not aware of this. And not, okay, it's good. That's not aware of it. And so we should like to become aware of it. Uh, and then, of course, facing reality may be very painful. And uh, maybe you don't really want to become aware of it because it means you have to reorganize your social relationships and who you live with, who you're dependent on. And that would take an, take an enormous act of courage to separate yourself from the things that you, the, the community you want to belong to um, but the price you pay for being at the community is that you do things to your body to not feel certain things. Uh, so moving away from that is a very complex and courageous thing. And, you know, for me, Abram is a great example. He was told to leave the, the, the land of Ur and to, to go and follow God's commands. And sometimes you just need to go and go on that pilgrimage and find out what it is that you need to do to have a life, just like Abraham did. <laughs> you know? Only, only, only to come back ultimately, hopefully, healthier and and more connected to your source, and that's that's ultimately hopefully. the goal. Um, an, another topic that comes up here often, and the question came in on it. Um, you know, a lot of research and treatment is out there for food disorders relating to anorexia and bulimia, et cetera, but not a lot of, at least not as readily available, it seems like. So part of this person's question is, my weight holds a lot of trauma. Food was and kind of still is my survival tool. I've run into health issues and the weight makes it uncomfortable to live day to day. I'm in therapy, working through my complex trauma and find it almost impossible to shed my weight right now but know that I should be making better choices for physical health. Would love to hear some guidance on that topic, Doc. Wow. Um, yeah. It sounds like uh, she uses food as a tranquilizer, uh, as a way of of calming that body down. And maybe 
there may, may be also been elements which I've oftentimes seen is that if you are obese, nobody will take an interest in your body. Uh, so it basically cuts off the possibility of uh, sexual connection with other people. And I would say that maybe an I'd explore that. I wouldn't be sure about it, but I'd say there may be something very protective about uh, making your body uh, unattractive to people around you because you don't get sexual attention from anybody else. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, and so uh, what you're doing, uh, the solution is a protection of your body. So the, the problem is the solution that you have found for yourself, but what is this, what is the solution for? Huh? And uh, there's some work right now going on with psychedelics for eating disorders. And I would be pretty intrigued with uh, the degree to which psychedelics can really help you to change some of those uh, patterns of defending yourself against- wow. Which things. psychedelic would be good for this? We don't we don't know at this point which psychedelic is better than which one. Uh, we are at a point in history that the people who do ketamine are respectful to people who do MDMA are respectful to people who do uh, psilocybin or ayahuasca. But I don't think we have really been able to figure out which one is better. And from my experience, they all do pretty similar things. Uh, uh, I would say whatever is available right now, most of these substances are still illegal. Ketamine is the only one that is legal. Uh, uh, so it is, we are on the, on the cusp of, of more explanations, but people are looking at, at psychedelics for anorexia and I have some great hope for that actually, yeah. Wow. So I, I have, um, I, we're gonna, I'm gonna go with two more questions, Dr. Rabbi Waiwai, and then hopefully we'll end up with some uh, words of chizuk. And Dr. Bessel, that means words of hope and inspiration. Um, oh, I thought I'd given you some hope. You are, you are, you are. But we're going to make a formal time for it. So, um, okay. And then the last question that that I'm going to ask for today, is, again, a little, little unique and different. Uh, but these things are common. And again, Rabbi Yy, uh, I'm assuming you uh, you come across this, but people being alienated by their family for being the truth teller. When when abuse and trauma is exposed, and somebody actually steps out of the the the, the darkness and uh, shares it or confronts it publicly, um, how can I comfort myself when my autonomical nervous system, my ANS system, speaking of uh, Doctor uh, Porges and Polyvagal, goes wild, and my body goes into shock when he receives messages or calls from family members, you know, going after him for, for exposing what is in reality the truth. No, I think, again, this is, again, very common. And so there you are feeling isolated. Your family that you hope will be there for you, in fact, has become your enemy. It happens all the time in families. Loyalty is a huge part of human behavior. Uh, becoming disloyal to your family is an excruciating step. And when you start exposing people and the reality of people, it's very likely that other members of the family will, their loyalty trumps their honesty and they will turn against you for speaking the truth. And I think the only solution that I know of that is becoming a member of another community of people who know what that's like. Uh, but this issue of longing for your own original community to accept you and love you is, a, is an eternal wish that we carry inside of ourselves. So it's always a source of great sorrow to have to be honest with your own community and tell the truth. And losing that community is a, a, a pain that you really carry with you for the rest of your life, but it can be compensated for it to a large degree by finding another community of people where you can tell the truth. But what if people are saying, you know, under psychedelics, you decided that your brother, your sister, your mother, your father raped you. You don't have a memory of it. And maybe you should doubt yourself. Maybe you're making up a story. 
Oh, it happens all. That happens all the time. Also, of course. So that uh, I've treated people for quite a long time, but there still is a part of them, uh, despite overwhelming evidence that it didn't really happen, and I'm just making this up. Uh, and but when you listen to their behavior and their stories, it's very clear that it did happen. But the the, the act of of acknowledging that people have done terrible things to you is a very extremely difficult and courageous act to take because we are programmed to love those people. Right. So the conflict to acknowledge that this person was sadistic and was, was really doing evil things is a very deep pain to carry inside of yourself. And the pain is real. It's not like, oh, it's not so bad, or you can easily overcome it. No, that is a that's a, a painful thing you carry with you, but hopefully you now are able to have warm relationships with your partner. Uh, you're able to have loving relationships with your kids, so you can form your own community that is based on a more honest interaction. But is it easy or simple or not filled with pain? Yes, it is, actually. If I, if I could sneak in one more question, because um, again, I think some of these, um, we try to get as many diverse topics and questions, doctor and Rabbi YY and get your feelings on it. But we, we, we've all been told and we hear that a, especially in 12 step programs, um, that part of a person's healing is giving back to someone else and being a support for someone else. When someone's going through their healing recovery, how do they know the balance of when is it, you know, because again, so much of trauma is not feeling anything about yourself unless you're always giving back. How do you have that balance to know this is a healthy version and this this helping of someone else is therapeutic and healing versus this that's just codependency and a trauma response? Is there any, do you have any tricks, doctor, that and Rabbi Waiwai, that perhaps somebody can gauge within themselves, this is a healthy version, this is coming from an unhealthy place. Well, you see, again, the, the, those terms are too judgmental for my taste. Huh? But, uh, but when you do group therapy or work in groups, you can notice that, um, you see, oh, it's interesting, you, you have these dramas, but have you noticed that it's been difficult for you to sometimes be helpful to other people. And maybe we could like to see what you can do to actually make other people feel better also, because that's part of life as well. Or uh, in the world I live in, I know many people who are wonderful therapists, wonderful nurses, wonderful school teachers who are knocking themselves out for other people and who have very severe trauma histories and who, live that time history by becoming uh, givers and givers and givers, but it doesn't make themselves feel better. Huh? And so then the issue as a therapist for me becomes, so how do you feel about this creature inside of yourself that feels so damaged and what are you doing for her? Huh? And so uh, much of the work that I do is steering people inside and having them have a loving relationship to themselves and for most time these people I know the hardest thing is to take care of and loving this creature that they inhabit. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I could just add one, one line. In Hebrew, the word forgiving, Natan, you could read from the right to the left and from the left to the right identically. It's one of those words where it's known self known both ways because when you give, yeah. it comes back to you. I'm giving and giving and giving and I'm just never satisfied and I feel like this bottomless pit and I have to give more and more and I can't even celebrate the fact that I touched a person positively right now for a few minutes. It means it's not about giving. It's about a oh. endless need for validation that comes from my own brokenness. Yeah, again, that is... It's judgmental. Go ahead, you do it. <laughs> it's really about that finding this creature who you are unacceptable, basically. That creature is never good enough. And so the issue is really about how can you do the same thing 
for yourself as you do for the kids you work with, the patients you work with. And developing a loving relationship with your own body is really a critical dimension of trauma therapy. I saw a line, don't go to gym because you hate your body. Go to the gym because you love your body. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. So Rabbi YY, perhaps we can move in uh, just the last few minutes here with the doctor, some inspiration, some Dibre Chizuk. As the doctor, yeah, I somebody here, I, I, want, I just want to ask Dr. one last question. Go ahead. I maybe sensitive because pe people ask this to me. Somebody who's been raped by his father for years and his father would hold him down and, and sexually molest him. And now he's a married man and he has a lot, a lot of inner trauma. One of the things he told me is that every night what he's craving is homosexual relationships with other men particularly them holding him down and forcing him, and that gives him an orgasm. Yeah. Do you, scientifically, do you see that connection? Is oh, that yeah, absolutely. I, I, I write about it in my book uh, under the chapter, The Pleasure of Pain and the Pain of Pleasure, and that when you get traumatized, things that ordinarily would make people feel pain may actually become reinforcing. So the reward system in your brain get changed, and you get turned on, by let's say getting beaten or getting raped. Uh, and that is a really very shameful and painful thing to live with. Uh, in my experience, neurofeedback has helped a number of people I've worked with, with that. Uh, so that's why I've seen it uh, change. I've not seen it change by talking only. Wow. Uh, it's uh, pre-verbal because it's pre-verbal. Yeah, it's, it's a different part of your brain. That reward system is is automatically set. You happen to love tomatoes, you hate asparagus, you know, where does it come from? It's just a, a reward thing that certain- Not, not talk yeah. therapy, neurofeedback or- uh... No, so talk therapy helps you to at least be aware of it, but I don't think it changes the reward system. I think it, the system needs to be jolted and I've seen it change dramatically in a number of people with neurofeedback. Uh, I've not uh, had enough experience with psychedelics to see if psychedelics can do that also sometimes. But so at this point, if somebody would ha have that, I would do neurofeedback with them. Uh, wait, there's always, these are always temporary opinions. Uh, 15 years ago, I did not know about neurofeedback. Uh, Eight years ago, when I wrote my book, I didn't know about psychedelics yet. And so these things always evolve. And right now, in 2023, this is what some people know. But 10 years from now, we may have a better answer. Wow. Yeah. Always be learning. You're a very big advocate of saying we know very little. Absolutely. But that's also very much in your tradition. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. In fact, the, the psalm says that Pharaoh was very impressed by Joseph because he was the first person to tell Pharaoh, I don't know, God knows. <laughs> Everybody else knew everything. Yeah. Joseph said, beloved, I don't know. Yeah. So Rabbi, why, why, as we wind down some... some yeah, I just, want to, I, I, I just want to highlight a, a line of, of Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, which I thought was, was so meaningful, simple and so profound when he said, you know, we, we delude ourselves to believe that we are isolated individualistic creatures when really we are all connected. We are all intertwined with each other. And therefore relationships are not luxury. They're not an extracurricular activity to add, you know, some icing on the cake of our identity, but they are essential to the formation of the I. And it moved me because one of the opening lines in the Bible, in the Torah is, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. A human yeah. being, the yeah. first thing that the Torah says is not good. Before yeah. murder, idolatry, uh, all the bad sins, the first thing that's not good in the Torah is it's not good for a person yeah. to be alone. And yeah. then I suddenly realized because the not goodness of that is, is essential to identity. Yeah. I think the fact well, that... Old, old girlfriend of mine used to say to me, a lonely man is a dangerous man. Wow. Well, Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So that, that's, that's very powerful. So the fact that, that, that each and every one of us, you know, we're, we're, we don't have the answers to, to all the problems, but 
I think each and every one of us can be an empathetic witness to somebody else. Each yep. and every one of us could look into somebody's eyes and instead of asking what's wrong with you, we can yep. ask what happened to you. Yeah, what happened to you? And who was there for you? Huh? So Oprah Winfrey wrote this nice book, I haven't read it, but uh, uh, what happened to you? And I think it's a good beginning title, but the next thing was, and who was there for you? Hmm. And that's as important as the first one. And, and, and what about if the answer is nobody? Nobody was there for me. And then, then is how can we get this company and how can we help you to create support for yourself in your life? Yeah. Wow. So this is the beginning of that, creating communities of, of people who are non <laughs> and we, we could look each other in the eyes with a sense of compassion and, and love and empathy. And, and yeah. so, you, know, you could share with me and I, I, I understand, I'm not judging. So I, I want to. And you wanna... said, if I'm not mistaken, you said when I asked what are the healing methods for trauma, Doctor Vessel said the first first thing is having somebody in your life who can just support you without, yep. right? Yep. Last time yeah. in our last yeah. session, yeah. I asked. Yeah. Huh? It's interesting that equine therapy is popular, and therapy dogs are popular. We study that actually. And if you have had nothing but really scary experiences with human beings, a dog or horse may be a very nice first step to get a physical sense of what it feels like to, to be safe with another creature. Right. Uh, last session, last time we met, I asked you a question from all the types of therapists and therapy models and psychology models. What type of therapist or psychologist would you suggest? And your answer was, and I want to, I want to almost paraphrase you because I want to still get your feedback for that. You said, it doesn't really matter. What matters most is that the psychologist or the therapist work out his own internal crap. Yes, work out the internal thing is very important, but also it's very curious about you. Huh? But the way we are trained as therapists is to categorize people and say, oh, you are an anorexic, you are a self-mutilator, you are something or another, and we categorize people, but it's critical that the person you work with knows about that you, there's nobody else in the world like you. Wow. You are a unique individual. I'm not sure you're such a non-believer. I mean, <laughs> all your statements that every person is unique and, and you're not cynical you call yourself a number. doctor doctor you got to take the 21 and me blood test again i think you know the DNA I, did, test. I, did. I know you did you came back like one 100th jewish but one I'm, of my most devastating experience i, I know I, we saw that a quarter jewish and i said i said to a friend of mine i said i'm a quarter jewish he said oh that's why you're so smart yeah, yeah. and i <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about studies for you, nothing, nothing. Right. Well, so I, think saying, Rabbi y, I think what Rabbi YY is saying is we believe that test may have been a mistake. You should take it again. I think so too. Okay. Because how, where did I get to my sense of humor? It must have been my Jewish grandmother, you know? Absolutely. But so I, you're saying the therapist has to really believe that every person is unique and they shouldn't give you textbook definitions. Right. And, you're bipolar, uh, you're psychotic. Yeah. Your sugar, your yeah. and to be curious about you. Huh? So tell me more. What's that like? And not to pretend like you know. Had to really say, what was that like for you? Had to we have a line, we have a line that we coined <laughs> here recently at Fresh Start ABC. Always be curious. Yeah. That's it. Just always be curious. So I do want to take this opportunity, Dr. Bessel Handercoke, Rabbi YY. Thank both of you, Dr. Bessel. I want to thank you for your continued insight, guidance, support with our program here at Fresh Start. Um, you know, we, I think we shared with you last time. We we didn't officially, but unofficially, we implemented uh, dancing in Klezmer. Rabbi Waiwai, you remember every time we get on with Dr. Bessel, he talks about the Jewish dancing. <laughs> so a few months ago, we had a group. And they were... Shema Yisrael. Oh. Oh. I was fooling. Yeah. So we implemented that. Um, but I do want to thank you. Thank you, Rabbi YY, for your continued chizik and, and support. And of course, thank you to all of our alumni for joining.
And uh, we will see all of you next time. Thank you again, folks. Wish you all the best. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.